Hello, welcome to your fourth Vision Tune Up Tuesday. My name is Nathan Oxenfeld with Integral Eyesight Improvement here in Asheville, North Carolina. And depending on where you're watching this from, you may still be in quarantine. I know certain states here in the USA are starting to kind of ease some of that stuff, but here in North Carolina, they've actually extended the quarantine a little bit longer. And originally, I intended to do these vision tune-ups for while we're in quarantine and give us some things to work with and play with our vision on. And so originally I was just going to do April, but now looks like I might be actually extending out and doing a couple more of these into May as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, another thing that's a little bit different than originally was planned, um, I was going to be leading a five-day vision retreat here in Asheville next month. That obviously has been postponed out to next year, so just to be safe. Um, so in lieu of that, I'm actually going to be doing a virtual vision retreat next month in May. So if you've been enjoying these free vision tune-ups over the past couple weeks and have been getting benefits from them and want to go even a little bit further and get a little bit more individualized attention from me, you might want to look into the virtual vision retreat that's going to be on Saturday and Sunday, May 16th and 17th. And you can find more information about that on my website, integraleyesight.com slash virtual. So, but today we're going to be moving into a new topic with our eye charts. So today's vision tune-up is really going to be focusing on how do we use eye charts, both big eye charts for the distance, as well as smaller eye charts for up close, to be actually improving our near vision and our far vision. So um, hopefully you've been able to actually get a copy of this and download it and print it out so that you have uh, some charts in your hands right now that you can follow along with me. Um, if not, that's okay. You can um, still follow along. Um, you know, I'll be holding this up on the screen you can use and you can always, you know, print this out and, and rewatch this replay later to really go through the, the materials with me in real time. And this chart is found on the website integraleyesight.com slash live, where all these replays are being posted and the links to the new live streams. And what I want to do is kind of tie together some of the things that we've already learned. So in the first Vision Tune-Up Tuesday, that theme was relaxation. So we're going to be learning how to relax with the charts. The second Vision Tune-Up Tuesday was all about movement. So we're going to learn how to incorporate some movement into reading charts. And then last week, our theme was central fixation. And so we're also going to be applying that concept and habit to reading and the eye charts. Now, if you have any experience with the Bates Method or if you've read Dr. Bates's book, um, you've probably seen him talk a lot about the Snellen test card. Now, the Snellen eye chart is the standard medical eye chart. So that's the one you see at the eye doctor when you go in for an eye exam. And what that is, is it's a standardized eye chart with randomized letters. And so you might right off the bat be wondering, you know, why we're not using that one, why we're we using this one instead. Well, like I just said, the, the foundation of the Bates method in learning how to heal our eyes and improve our vision naturally is based on relaxation. And I don't know about you, but the Snellen test card, the, the medical eye chart, isn't always the most relaxing thing to look at. For some people, even just the thought of that chart can stress you out. So the first thing I want to do today is I want to actually start to relax with the charts. Because if we go into reading the charts with this stress and strain and maybe negative association of going to the eye doctor and having to test your vision, then the chart's not going to look very good, right? So I don't really want you to treat this too much like a test. We're, we're kind of using this more as a tool to actually achieve clear flashes, these moments of actually better vision, where maybe at the start of today, you can only get down to a certain point, but then through a little bit of practice and a little bit of time, and relaxation, you can maybe get down one or two or three lines farther down than when you started. So although in general, we don't want to use this as a test, 
I do want you to take a look at your chart right now before we do anything with it, just to kind of see how it looks without your glasses or contacts. So if you're nearsighted, you're going to be using the big eye chart, either somewhere in arm's length, or you might even want to hang it up on the wall. So if you just tape it to the wall, or if you can lean it up against something and then find some distance where maybe it's not looking so clear anymore. There's actually some blur in the distance. You want to see, you know, how far down you can go at, I don't know, maybe five feet, maybe 10 feet. If you're more nearsighted, you might actually be holding it closer and that's okay. But if you're farsighted, I'll probably ask you to use the smaller chart, probably this one or maybe this one. But what you're doing is you're seeing, you know, where you can, without your reading glasses, where you can hold it and how far down you can go until you feel like, you know what, this is a challenge. It's difficult to read. That's kind of the threshold. And today we're going to see if we can actually go beyond that and see a little bit better than we started with. So once you kind of take note of how the chart's looking right now and maybe which number line, you know, either number one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, or you can use these numbers on the side, the 2150, 2075, 2050, 2040, 2025, 2020, 2010. So whichever way you want to kind of record it or, or make note of it. But right from this point, we're going to switch gears and stop using this as test and more as a relaxation device. So you're gonna have your chart set up either on the wall, in the distance, or in your hand, and you're gonna close your eyes because that's one of the first simplest ways that we can bring relaxation in is to shut the eyes. And what did we learn in the first vision tune-up? We learned breathing, yawning, sighing, a little bit of relaxation starting to happen in the breath, Ah, maybe you can feel some tightness or tension in your facial muscles or your head or your neck or your shoulders starting to dissipate, starting to melt away a little bit with each breath or yawn. Ah, just really settling in and letting go of any kind of trying or effort or tension. And then we can kind of connect in with our touchstone. And remember, the touchstone is this mental picture or this mental movie, something that makes you feel good and relaxed. It can be anything in the world. It can be a person, a place, a thing, a memory, an experience. But I just want you to think about your touchstone right now with your eyes closed and see how that makes you feel a little bit better. You're just a little bit calmer, a little bit more centered. Maybe there's a little smile starting to come to the corners of your mouth. And when you're in this mental relaxation state, that is when you flash your eyes open real quick on the chart and then you close again. So this is the flashing or the reverse blinking that we've done as a way to come out of palming in the past in our vision tune-ups. But we're just gonna go from eyes closed and then you just flash open on the chart for literally just a fraction of a second. It's like you're taking a little picture of the chart. So you're not even really giving yourself very much time to analyze what you've just seen. You're just seeing what, you know, your eyes land on for that quick moment and then they're closed again. And remember, if you're nearsighted, you want to be doing this maybe at a distance where the chart is a little blurry in, in the distance. If you're farsighted, you want the chart to be kind of closer than normal. It's, it's blurry up close so that when you flash open and take this relaxation with you from eyes closed into eyes open, you might actually get a little clear flash. You actually glimpse a sharper letter, maybe it's darker black, there's less blur or less doubling or whatever's going on. And what we're doing is we're taking this internal relaxation with us as we open back up. So after you do some flashing and some reverse blinking, then you can just kind of open your eyes back up and look at your chart and allow the breath to continue because a lot of times the chart will kind of take our breath away in a sense and we'll do some shallow breathing or hold our breath by accident. So make sure you're still breathing, you're still relaxing, and even when your eyes are open and you're starting to look at the chart again, you're not forgetting about your touchstone. You're still thinking about that person or that place or that thing or that memory that really makes you feel relaxed. This is a way to make this eye chart seem a little less daunting if we actually incorporate our visualization and our memory and imagination into it. So 
that's a little bit of, of how we, we learn from week one, the relaxation, starting to look at the chart with more relaxed eyes. So it's not about squinting or squeezing or trying to focus on the chart. That's one of the bad vision habits. So we're actually learning a new way to focus. How can I get this chart to come into better focus by relaxing without doing anything with the eye muscles, just total relaxation. But from there, we move into what we learned in the second tune-up, which is movement. So we're gonna do some long swinging with our charts, and we're gonna do some short swinging with our charts. So if you can hold your chart in your hand, whether it's the big one or one of the smaller ones, you're gonna stand up, or if you'd like, you can stay seated as well. But I'm, do, I'm gonna do this standing. I'm gonna hold my chart here, and I'm gonna begin my long swing with the chart. In the second vision tune-up, we were learning the long swing, just looking out into the distance and just getting the eyes more comfortable and used to actually moving and shifting a lot more. And you know, you can look at your thumb for the long swing to kind of give you something to focus on. So now we're replacing the thumb with the chart. And you're noticing that, wow, everything behind the chart in the background actually appears to be moving in the opposite direction that the chart is moving. So as I swing to the left, the computer goes off to the right. And then when I swing over to the right, now the computer goes off to the left. And not just the computer, but everything in my room, the lamp, the windows, the microphone, the keyboard, the mouse, my water cup, my coffee cup, everything behind the chart is swinging and moving in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna now close my eyes and I'm gonna remember that. I'm gonna keep swinging. So keep doing the long, slow swing left and right. Whether you're standing or seated, you can still do this big 180 degree swing if that's comfortable. And I'm just remembering that, okay, as the chart goes to the left, the background goes to the right. And as the chart goes to the right, the background goes to the left. And this is very soothing to my visual system. It's very relaxing to all my nerves and the eye muscles start to relax. So when I open back up, I'm just continuing to observe this oppositional movement effect that happens behind the chart. So we can actually use the chart as a part of our long swing, but we also want to actually hone in the, the swing more on the chart for the short swing. So instead of you know, doing this big movement, now you're gonna do kind of a shorter swing from the black dot to the left of the A over to the black dot to the right of the A. So you're gonna do this swinging, kind of shifting movement, and you can kind of follow it with your nose. You can kind of pivot your head and kind of create this swinging movement. And when you were doing the long swing and you were noticing the background move in the opposite direction, now what you can notice is that the A in between these two dots is now moving in the opposite direction, okay? So when you go from this dot all the way over to this dot, the A kind of moves the opposite way. Then when you go back from here over here, the A kind of goes in the opposite way. And if that's not appearing with your eyes open, go ahead and try it with your eyes closed. So you close your eyes, you remember a big A, there's a black dot to the left, a black dot to the right, and you're just swinging back and forth from the left dot to the right dot. And you might get more of a sense of this oppositional swing or movement mentally with your eyes closed before you're seeing it more with your eyes open. And the more you do it with your eyes closed, the easier it is to actually see it with the eyes open as well. So this is an example of a shorter swing on the chart. And, and this is something that not a lot of people naturally do when they look at a chart. Sometimes when they see a chart, they just kind of stare at it. They just get kind of stuck on one letter and there's not this shifting or movement going on around. So I really want you to think about how can I infuse motion and movement into an eye chart or into just reading a book or reading a computer screen? Because reading itself does not have a ton of movement innately built into it compared to like going on a walk outside or playing sports or, you know, moving your body around. There's a lot more motion in that activity. Reading, usually we're sitting still. A lot of people keep their head completely still while they read and it's just the eyes moving. But 
part of this swinging thing is getting us a little bit more in tune with getting some movement into something like reading. So if you're on your computer screen, you can actually maybe do a little head swinging or a little swing in your chair side to side. That makes your computer time much more relaxing than just staying completely still, keeping the, the head frozen and the eyes just scanning around on the screen. So we kind of use the chart as a way to practice this movement within reading. Okay, so <clears throat> Dr. Bates actually said, when you look at an eye chart, you're supposed to see the letters moving. It's supposed to look like these letters are alive, they're dynamic, they're vibrating. Now, it's partly in your imagination, but it is also partly visual. Because when your central vision moves around on the chart, you're noticing peripheral movement, not only around the chart like you saw with the long swing, but even within the chart, you're actually maybe seeing this illusion that the letters appear to be kind of moving up and down or side to side as you scan around it. So speaking of central fixation, that's what we covered last week. So I wanna show you how to do that on your eye chart as well, because sometimes when we see an eye chart, we just, just diffuse out and we try and just take it all in as one chart. Or even if we're on one line, we might actually be trying to see that whole line all at once. So multiple letters or just too much all at once. And that turns out to be a bad vision habit that leads to more blur. So when you look at an eye chart with central fixation, what that means is that you're paying most attention to one tiny point on the chart which is part of the reason why I added these black dots to the chart. We've got these ones up here at the top that are a little bit bigger, then we've got some smaller ones down here, and all the way down at the bottom, we've got these tiny ones. Okay, so these little black dots represent your central vision. And in fact, your central vision is even smaller than these black dots. But having these little black dots on the chart acts as a really good reminder that, hey, I'm not supposed to be trying to see an area any larger than this black dot. If anything, I'm trying to look at an area smaller than this black dot. Maybe this tiny one, or maybe even smaller than the tiny one. Like on here, you've got this little itty bitty tiny black dot. That's the area that you wanna be focusing your central vision on. And you might already notice that, well, wow, this letter is much bigger than this black dot. So it's actually impossible to actually try and see that whole A equally clearly. That would be that diffusion that, we, that we're trying to get rid of and start to learn central fixation instead. So last week, I introduced this concept of counting corners. So if you can count the number of corners that, for example, the D has. So we've got one corner there, two corners there, and then three four on the inside. The whole rest is all curved. There's no right angles. So we're really just looking for those right angles. So the corner of that D, where that right angle is, that's your little central fixation point. And if you're trying to see the whole D, you are diffusing. So you're practicing shrinking your central vision down to that little point, but not staring. You're not getting stuck on that corner because right when you land on that corner, you're already shifting down to the next corner and then shifting back up to the next corner, shifting down to the next corner. And then if you want to count the corners on the E, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And as you're counting these corners, you are essentially in this more central fixation kind of mode. Because when you're busy counting how many corners that the letter F has, you're not trying to see what the other letters are on the chart. And that's a good thing. When you're on one letter, you want to let the other letters kind of go. You want to let them be more peripheral and you're not as focused in on them. Now, the the paradox of central fixation is that when you do shrink your central vision down and you achieve that little tiny point of focus, it actually does make everything come in better. Not just that one little spot, but your peripheral vision improves as well. So you, when you get a clear flash, it's not only on the one letter you're centralizing on, 
but it might actually spread out and you actually do see the other lines, the other letters on that line clearer, maybe even getting some clarity on the lower lines as well. And that's a good thing. We want, you know, we want when you're working on this line and all of a sudden a letter on the next one out uh, down pops out, you want to go ahead and jump down and start working with that new smaller line, doing your relaxation, your, your movement and your shifting and swinging and your central fixation. And, while you're busy doing that, you might notice that a little flash of clarity appears on the next line down. So then you keep working your way down smaller and smaller. If you're nearsighted, you might find that you're able to hold the chart farther and farther away. Or if it's on the wall, you can step farther and farther back as you're stretching your vision out. Whereas if you're farsighted and you're using the smaller charts, you might find that at first it's out here and it's really blurry. But then doing some of these techniques, you actually can start to hold it a little bit closer and you can still read it. And you're stretching your vision closer and closer in to regain that flexibility of your focus. So the, the, we've, we've reviewed from vision tune-up one, the relaxation, vision tune-up two, the swinging and the movement, vision tune-up three with the central fixation. And I just want to add one little extra thing before we take a little palming break and then I answer a couple questions is this concept that memory brings vision. So the reason we don't use the Snellen chart and just this random letters and instead we're using the alphabet is because you already know the alphabet. The alphabet is already committed to memory. So when you look at the alphabet chart, even if your vision gets blurry past line three and you can't see the other letters on the smaller lines, well, you know that the last letter on this line is F. And so even if this is too blurry to see in your mind, you already know what it is. And Dr. Bates said that we, we tend to see familiar things better than we see unfamiliar things. And so the Snellen test card is, pretty unfamiliar for most people, but the alphabet is pretty familiar. And so if you have the answer in your mind, then you, there's more of a chance that you're actually going to focus and get a clear flash on that letter versus if you had no idea what the chart said and you got to a certain point and you just give up and say, okay, that's it. That's as far as I can go. Well, this one, technically you can make your way all the way down to the, the end of the 2020 line because it goes from A to Z. Now the 2010 line, which is even below the 2020 line, that's A through P. So if you already know and you study it up close and you know exactly what the chart says and you know which letters are on which line and you really commit this, not just the alphabet to memory, but this chart of how there's one A at the top, there's B and C on line two, so you're memorizing what line three, line four, line five, line six, and line seven say. And if you have this really good mental picture and this memory of what the chart says, even if it's really far away, if you're nearsighted and it all looks like a blur, you can still play with it based off of the internal picture you've got in your head. And as you do that, the, the blurry letters start to develop and actually form into the letter that you have in your head. So we want to really embrace our memory as a help in our vision, as opposed to suppressing our memory, which is what I used to do. You know, when my vision teacher first told me about this concept, I felt like it's kind of like cheating because I wasn't actually seeing it. I was just memorizing it. But she just hammered it into my head over and over. Memory brings vision. Memory brings vision. And if I wanted my vision to come back, I had to use my memory. So I want you to use your memory with your eye chart. And as you're doing this, a really powerful chart technique is doing some near and far matching. So I didn't only create these three sizes so that you can have the, the big chart and the distance for nearsightedness and the near chart for farsightedness, but we also want to incorporate all three of these into the near and far matching. So for example, if I've got my, see if I can balance this. <laughs> I've got my chart here on the lamp 
it's actually kind of nice. It's got some nice light on it coming up through behind. That's a good point with the eye chart is you really want sufficient lighting on it to really set yourself up for success. But what you do is you hold the, the one in your hand, the smaller one up close, and you do a lot of near and far shifting. So I would look at the A near and I would jump out, look at the A far, and I would do that a couple times with the A. Maybe I would even do it with my eyes closed. So I would close my eyes. Okay, I'm remembering the A up here. I'm remembering the A out there. And I'm going back and forth and I'm matching them. Then I want to do the B. So I would say, okay, B near, B far, C near, C far. And you can make your way down. And if you're nearsighted, you want to hold this up close where it's nice and clear already. So you, you're actually getting the answer key here in your hand. And then you're improving the blurry distance version because it's an identical chart. There's no difference. So you're looking at the clear version as a way to improve the blurry version. If you're farsighted, it might be kind of opposite where the distance chart might look better and this one is blurrier. So you're looking at the A out there to get the clearer version and then you come up here to improve the blurry version. And like I said, we wanna do this eyes open and eyes closed as a way to be working with our eyesight and our insight as well. So either throughout this time we've been playing with the charts or maybe right now at the end of doing a couple chart techniques, you can just check in and see how your vision compares to 20 minutes ago when we started this. And you know, is it the same as the beginning? Is it a little worse than the beginning? Is it a little bit better than the beginning? We just want to notice what's going on with our vision because we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And our vision kind of acts like a biofeedback tool where if it gets blurrier, we, we might actually be doing it wrong or we might be straining. Whereas if it gets clearer, that's a, a good positive biofeedback that, yeah, you're doing it right. You're getting a clear flash. You're relaxing into the focus and there's no strain there. So, and if it stays the same, that's okay too, because sometimes there are delayed or lagged effects with this stuff where you might do a chart session today and then you wake up tomorrow and your vision is a little bit sharper because of yesterday's vision practice. So sometimes there are those immediate changes. Other times it is a little bit lagged. So I would be curious to hear, for those of you who are here with me live right now, if you have any noticeable changes or improvements um, you know, not only am I curious, but the other people here might get inspired by, by your experience as well. But I do want to make sure that we do a quick little palming session because the eye chart sometimes can be a little tiring if we, we accidentally strain by accident or we're trying too hard. Um, so if we generate any kind of tension or strain during the chart time, we really want to make sure that we're immediately letting that go. and it's actually good, you know, we could have taken a little palming break in between each one of those things we did with the chart, but just for time's sake, I just wanted to kind of flow through them as a, as a unit. So I'm going to grab my palming board, and I invite you to join me for just a short little palming session just to integrate some of the benefits you just generated. So you cover up your eyes with your palms. You have your elbows rested on some surface so that your shoulders don't get tired. And you're just kind of settling in, letting any kind of lights or colors kind of fade away into the darkness, into the blackness. And what I want you to do, once you kind of do a little quick body scan, make sure you're relaxing your body, your shoulders, your back, and maybe slowing down your breath a little bit is I want you to visualize having already achieved clear vision in the area where you'd like it. So if you're nearsighted, you're picturing being able to see the eye chart at 20 feet and farther. And everything in the distance is crystal clear without your glasses or contacts. If you're farsighted, you're visualizing right now that when you open up that book or that newspaper, or lift up your phone to read that email or whatever, that it just comes into that nice crystal clear focus without your reading glasses. 
That's what we're working on with these eye charts is we are training our visual system to relearn how to focus automatically without any effort or strain. We are getting our eyes to relax into focus and starting to work like our other senses that we're not trying to control or strain like our ears or our nose or our tongue or our skin. We're just letting those happen automatically. So why are we trying so hard with our eyes? Well, the eye chart is our teacher to teach us how to stop trying to see. So the eye chart is not about trying. It's not about squinting. It's not about straining to see how far down you can go. It's about how little you can try and how you can start to access this involuntary, effortless, automatic focus through relaxation, dynamic relaxation. So we're going to slowly transition out of palming. So you want to keep your eyes closed, but let your eyes readjust to the light before you maybe do a couple more of your little flashes or reverse blinks, either back on your eye chart or maybe onto the screen or out the window or something. But once again, one thing I like to say is that before you can really see clearly on the outside with your eyes open, you have to first develop your ability to see clearly on the inside with your eyes closed, which is why most of these chart techniques we did today, we did both with the eyes open and with the eyes closed. And that's a big mistake that a lot of people make with their eye charts is they simply spend too much time with their eyes open. And if you can actually commit that chart to memory so that when you close your eyes, it just appears right there in your inner vision, then that is really, really, really going to help your outer vision of the chart. But it takes practice. Uh, but it doesn't take a ton of time. You know, just what we did today is enough for a, a kind of a daily chart thing or even less time. Dr. Bates said to read the chart for half a minute or more. So he set the bar pretty low at just 30 seconds. But in my experience, when I would spend a little bit more time with it, maybe three minutes or 10 minutes or sometimes a little bit longer, um, it, it would take some time for the clarity to actually develop and come through. So you really want to be patient with it and try not to be too judgmental of yourself or your vision or how the chart's looking. You really want to remain open and receptive and, and relaxed through this process. But it is a challenge. And, and the, I, I consider the eye chart as a part of the third phase of vision training. So I teach vision training in three phases. And we usually don't get into the eye chart stuff until we've already covered some of the more foundational stuff first. So that's why we waited till the fourth week to do the, the eye charts and in the next couple of vision tune-ups, I may be revisiting this a little bit more. Um, but for now, I really want to just open this inquiry up in your mind of how can I really use the eye chart to improve my vision, not just to check my vision, and how can I actually relax in the presence of the eye chart? And how can I even fall in love with the eye chart so that every day when I look at it, it puts me in a good mood? It doesn't, it doesn't bum me out or I don't, I don't treat it like this medical device or this chore that I have to do every day. It's actually something to kind of look forward to because that's your nice relaxing vision time. But it's a process of getting to that point. So today I just wanted to kind of introduce it to you, um, you know, give you some experiences with, with how to play with it um, to give you a little guidance around that this part of the, the Bates method that honestly creates a lot of confusion for people. Uh, most people can figure out some of the basics on their own, but by the time it comes to the eye chart, a lot of people get lost with it. So it's, it's, I'm here to kind of help guide you through that process um, and definitely let me know if you have any specific questions about it, which um, I'd like to hang around for a little bit longer and answer some questions. But if you do have to go, I really appreciate you for being here for our fourth Vision Tune-Up Tuesday. Um, and like I said, if, you, if you're interested in going deeper into kind of more of an immersion style thing, then definitely check out that virtual vision retreat. Um, I am going to have to limit the size of that to a certain number because I want to be able to give each person some individualized attention. And, you know, if there's 100 people, uh, like in these vision tune-ups, I might not be able to get to everybody. So um, 
the registration for that is open, but uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'll be just sharing a little more information about that too. But I was bummed that I had to postpone the in-person retreat, but hopefully this virtual one will be a good placeholder in the meantime, and we can still uh, have an opportunity to meet up in person next year. All right, so let's see here what we got in the comments here. Just scrolling back to the beginning. So Claire started off with a good question of, can you share the frequency with which we should do the relaxation and palming and other exercises? Um, if you brush your teeth every day, then I also expect you to palm your eyes every day. It's just a part of your eye hygiene that is required, you know, in the morning and the evening. So if you can palm your eyes first thing when you wake up, literally before you even get out of bed, just wake up, palm your eyes, even if it's just for 10, 20, 30 seconds, ideally you can go for a little bit longer, but even just a quick palming thing is a, an amazing way to start your day and to end your day. So when you're back in bed, falling asleep, just place your palms on your eyes and do a nice little visualization to kind of lead you into sleep. That's such a better thing to do for your eyes than just staring at your phone before you go to sleep. So I want you to make this uh, a regular daily kind of routine, even if it's just short, right? It doesn't have to suck up a bunch of time. It can, what, what makes this stuff work is the repetition of it, not necessarily these, you know, super long sessions with it. Um, so yeah, I would definitely encourage you to get very regular with it. And, uh, and even with the eye chart, you know, Dr. Bates said that the, the easiest way to reverse myopia is to read your eye chart every day. And the best way to prevent and reverse presbyopia, farsightedness, is to read fine print up close every day. So the little tiny eye chart up close. So it doesn't, and like he said, it just takes a half a minute or more. So it's not this huge thing. We just want to get into the rhythm of it. Uh, Jag said, can vision improve without clear flashes? Um, the clear flashes are the first steps of vision improvement. So they're like little previews or little glimpses of what's possible. Um, so my initial answer to that question is, I don't think so. Probably not. Um, unless you're, you know, one of these rare cases where you just have more of kind of a spontaneous improvement or a spontaneous healing where you just go from blurry vision to just like, perfect vision without that much in between, but that's not too common. You know, in my experience and most of my other students is, you know, they, they have a lot of these moments of clarity and clear flashes along the journey and they grow and they extend and they get longer and, and come more frequently until eventually that becomes your new baseline, that, that level of clarity. So uh, I think, clear flashes are a hallmark of improvement. And that's really kind of what we're uh, aiming for in doing a lot of these vision practices is to cultivate these very regular clear flashes every day. Bethany says, hi, Nathan, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> trying to keep it together in, in the quarantine and, and stay follow the guidelines and everything and trying to stay focused and relaxed as well. So a couple comments saying that the sound was a little off. Um, sorry about that. Hopefully that kind of sorted itself out. That's the one thing you never know with these live streams is uh, sometimes the, the technical side can throw you off a little bit. Uh, let's see. So Serena said, how far away should we stand from the ABC chart? So if you're nearsighted, what I would encourage you to do is start fairly close where the majority of the chart is actually pretty easy to make out, right? So we're kind of used to at the eye doctor having to start at 20 feet or six meters, right? That's sort of the standard distance to read your eye chart to check for normal vision. But when you're using your eye charts at home to improve your vision, remember, it's not a test. It's more of a game. And so you actually start up close where the game is easy. <laughs> you know, you want to start on the easy difficulty and then you start to try the intermediate difficulty where maybe if you're starting at one or two or three feet from your chart, then you might try it at four or five or six feet. And then, you know, from there, once you're getting better at that, then you can try the hard level, the advanced level, and you can try going back to 10, 15, 20 feet eventually over time. But when you're first starting off, I would encourage you to 
be at a distance where, you know, the majority of the chart, you know, all the way down to probably the last one or two lines is actually fairly easy to see, even if there is a little blur around it. Um, so you want to set yourself up for success here, right? You don't, you don't want to make it super, super difficult for yourself. Then you're not going to get as many clear flashes. So if it's already a little closer to your comfort zone, you're going to get more improvements and, and notice more changes happening versus if you just start way off in the distance. Um, so yeah, I want you to find that comfortable distance to start with and then kind of expand from there. Hey, Brian, it's good to see you. Glad you can make it here. Nice. You went and said, I've been following through the vision practices in your book and I've noticed greater moments of vision clarity, a sign that my vision is improving. Thank you for the YouTube videos. Yeah, that's awesome, UN. You know, a lot of the, the things I teach are found in my book, Give Up Your Glasses for Good. So that kind of acts as like a workbook or a reference to, you know, have all the step-by-step -step instructions for all these practices I've been sharing with you. So that's definitely a good resource if you don't have that. Uh, Lana said, how many times a day do you recommend palming? So, like I said before, we can start the day and end the day with palming, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. But I also want you to take little palming breaks throughout the day as well. So there's a story in the recent uh, Better Eyesight magazine, so the Better Eyesight podcast that we're doing, where Dr. Bates actually asked uh, one of his, I think it was a 10-year-old girl who was improving her vision. Um, she was asked to palm her eyes, uh, I think, every hour for like five minutes. So at the top of every hour, she would palm for five minutes or so. And, you know, she was asked to kind of record how many times she did it or didn't do it. And she was a really eager student. And so she really kind of ran with it. And during the week, she did it like eight times a day throughout the day. But then on the weekend, she did it like 14 times a day. And she got these really fast improvements because she was in really taking the advice of the, you know, Dr. Bates and, and doing the practices and really making it a part of her day. That's the only way we're going to get the results. We're not going to get the results if we don't do the, do the practice. So um, there's really, you know, honestly, the more the better, <laughs> you know, like you can't do palming too much. And especially with computers and screens, like taking those palming breaks is so critical for restoring the eyes after screen time. Uh, Serena asked about um, can or should we practice the goalpost fusion on a daily basis? How long should we practice? So that's referring to previous vision tune-up where we held a pen or a pencil or a finger up in front of the nose and we actually did some swinging with the chart of getting that letter in between the gate posts or the goal posts. So that is a, a great eye chart technique that you could totally do like in our routine today to incorporate into that. But it's not just for charts. You can swing anything between your gate posts. So right now, I'm swinging the van out in the driveway in between my gate posts. I'm swinging my face on the computer screen in between the gate posts. So it is a nice little daily thing to do. Um, you don't have to spend a ton of time doing it. What I would treat it as, as a, is a way to activate your fusion. What I mean by that is if you just hold up your finger and see it double, swing your head, pick an object to swing it between it just a couple times, maybe a few times with your eyes closed, and you go back down, that, that, that kind of activates your fusion and makes sure that both of your eyes are online and working together. So kind of like that palming example is maybe instead of doing like, you know, a big chunk of time practicing the gate posts, you just maybe a couple times a day, you just hold your finger up or a pen or a pencil and you just check, hey, is the fusion on right now? Can I swing this thing between them? And then you lower it and then you just go back to your task. Um, so we want this to be something that is really easy and quick that we can just pull out of our tool belt, apply it for just 30 seconds or a minute, and then we just kind of put it back in the tool belt and we keep on doing our visual task. Um, so but it really depends. And if it's something you really like, you can do it more. If it's something that's not working too great, you can do it less. Um, we really want to learn how to customize all this. Serena also asked, how can you use the chart, uh, use the eye chart if your vision in each eye is a different prescription? It's a great question. Today we did the eye chart with both eyes open together. Another really important thing to incorporate into your chart is an eye patch. Now, I have been enjoying using these half patches because 
if I shut my left eye, I can't see the screen right now, but I can still see out the window because I have my whole peripheral field available to me, as opposed to a full patch, which would completely shut out this whole visual field. So we want to use either a full patch or a half patch, or if you don't have an eye patch, you can always just palm one eye or partially palm one eye like this. Um, so it is actually smart to isolate one eye with the chart and then the other eye with the chart and then both eyes together with the chart. Um, but just for time's sake today, we just did it with both eyes together. Um, but if you have a stronger prescription in your right eye, for example, then you might end up spending more time with the eye patch over your left eye and you're actually giving the right eye a chance to develop and to get up on the level of the left eye. Because I had different prescriptions when I first started, so I had to work on bringing the two eyes into harmony and balance with each other so that they could keep both improving together as a team as opposed to independently. All right, let's see here. Sunglare said, um, starting in February, I, I was getting a bunch of floaters and doesn't seem to be getting better. Already checked for retinal tear and inflammation. Yeah, sometimes if floaters are kind of extreme or if, if there's a lot of them, it could be an indication of something more serious. But um, if there's no you know issue with the retina or, or retinal detachment or vitreal detachment or whatever, um, then I would, I would say to just kind of keep sticking with your Bates routine, your swinging, your sunning, your palming. Um, as a way to potentially address the floaters. Um, they are fairly common and, and fairly harmless, but they definitely are kind of annoying and they can kind of interfere with the vision at times. So whenever I asked my vision teacher about my floaters, she just kept saying, just keep improving your vision. The more your vision improves, the less you even see the floaters. So all the things we've done so far in these vision tune-ups can potentially help with that. And there is sometimes also a dietary component or a lifestyle component that you might want to tweak as well. Luis said, hi, how do you recommend this type of procedure? Alternate every, oh, wait, see. Alternate every day or do each one a week. So it kind of depends on your schedule. Um, what I would say is in general, less is more. So instead of feeling like you need to do everything every single day, I think it works better if you just pick one or two or three things to do per day. And then the next day, you either do the same thing or you pick one or two or three different things to do the next day. So you've got some variety so that this doesn't get boring or repetitive. You know, we, we want it to be kind of fresh and exciting and engaging and fun. And if we just do the same exact routine every single day, and if it's overwhelming us and stressing us out, then guess what? We're not relaxing and then we're not getting the benefits. So I want you to do whatever you need to, to, to simplify this and really make it accessible and easy for you to just pick up, knock it out for the day, and then go about the rest of your business and just get into this regular routine with it. So kind of depends um, on your schedule and kind of what you gravitate towards when it comes to the practice. Oh, awesome. Michelle said, wow, I got a clear flash right now. Always amazing. Uh, so exciting. I love, you know. I've put a lot of these videos out on YouTube, you know, that I pre-recorded and then and then put up and then people say, hey, this helped me with my vision or I got this improvement. And, and that's great. It's exciting. But when it's like live and in real time, it just is even that more special. So really glad that that, that happened for you today. And those moments and those experiences really fuel your own motivation and, you know, get you on board with the possibility of what you can accomplish with your vision. It's really exciting. Cake said, hey, Nathan, speed reading is, uh, is a read thing or is the eye not capable? So, um, yeah, you know, when we relax our eyes and our vision, we can actually potentially increase our, our reading rate. And Dr. Bates actually developed a type of reading called thin white line reading, which is a little bit different than maybe you were taught how to read in school originally. Um, and he says that once you really master this more relaxed way type of reading, it actually can lead into speed reading. So it is a possibility. Heather said, uh, please more slowly re-explain how to optimally short swing on our laptop and any other top ways to be visually on our laptop. So the short 
swing on the screen, for example, would be from one of my eyes to the other eye, right? So instead of you just staring at my whole face and, and having that diffused kind of gaze, remember you shrink your central fixation point down so that it fits inside one of my pupils or you're looking at the colored part of my eye, the iris. And right from that point, you swing over to the other one and you study the other iris or the other pupil. And then you come back and you're getting this little gentle pendulum-like movement across my face. So now you're not staring, you're not diffusing, and you're not straining because you're shifting and you're centralizing, which is relaxing. So, you know, it, it, if you're not looking at a person, you know, if you're just reading an email or you're reading an article, you're also swinging because your eyes are scanning across the screen and you have an opportunity to notice that as you read the sentence from left to right, the sentence moves from right to left. It's a very subtle awareness, but, and it's not meant to like be a distraction from what you're reading. It's just one little part of your visual system in your brain is keeping track and noticing, hey, as I read across the screen here, the whole screen itself seems to be moving kind of in the opposite way. And if you get your head involved and you swing your head as you read, as opposed to keeping your head still and just doing it with your eyes, that effect is much more easily noticed. So uh, also on a laptop or a computer, um, I think I mentioned this last week with the mouse. If you take your mouse cursor and you just move it left and right or up and down, then that is, you're just following the mouse and you're kind of attracted to that moving object and that creates this oppositional movement. So if I move my mouse across my face on my screen, remember when we were doing the, the thumb with the swing or with the chart today in the swing and you noticed the background moving in the opposite way, when my mouse goes from the left to the right, it looks like my head goes in the opposite way. So if you ever feel like you are losing the swing or you're starting to diffuse, if you just wiggle your, your computer mouse around a little bit and kind of follow that, then that sort of reestablishes the swing and the shift and the central fixation. So it's, um, but it's just a matter of, of remembering to do it. Michelle said, lately I'm dealing with double vision. I follow advices of your book. Which are the best advices to resolve double vision? Thanks a lot for these live videos. So, um, that, that's kind of a separate topic that we would definitely um, we could definitely go in together, into together. Um, right now, I'm working with a handful of students who are working with double vision. So there's uh, a lot in the fusion section of the vision training. Earlier, I said that there's I teach three phases of vision training. What we did today with the eye charts is in phase three, uh, but in phase two, it's called fusion, and that's like one of the gate posts is an example of fusion. And uh, that might be a topic that I, I cover a little bit in the next week or two of the vision tune-up. So I might reserve that question for next time. Bill Corvo said, Hi, I have my right eye is minus three, left one is minus one. Should I practice uh, covering the one with minus three? So like I said, I kind of addressed that with the eye patch. Yes, I do recommend that you cover up one eye and play with the chart with just one eye by itself for a little bit and then you switch over to the other one so that you're giving each eye its own time its own chance to work without the other one interfering Let's see. okay brahmi abdo also said can you please talk about double vision and how to resolve it uh like i said that that'll be uh maybe next week next tuesday or the next one we can kind of focus in a little bit more on that Awesome. Bethany said, my Chinese acupuncture, acupuncturist had told me to do the exact same thing about palming the eyes. That's awesome. Yeah, this a lot of this Bates Method stuff is sourced out of, um, you know, based off of some yoga things or from Chinese medicine or, you know, martial arts, different things kind of remind, some, from the Bates Method might remind you of some other things. And, and I don't think that's a coincidence. So that's cool that you already had that, that expose, exposure. Let's see. So Jag also said, I just read about switching. Can I do that every day? Is it possible to do too much of one thing? 
Uh, not totally sure what you're referring to about switching. If you want to clarify that, I can I can answer that. But um, in general, the the second part of the question, you know, is it possible to do too much of one thing? Uh, yeah, I think it is. I think it is possible to overdo it. You know, sometimes we get a little over eager with our eyes, and we we might overwork them, or we might try too hard, or we're just like putting too much into it. And so we want to find that sweet spot where. It's not that we're overdoing it and it's not that we're underdoing it. We're doing our practice every day, but it's very relaxed and, and fluid and easy. And it's not like this militaristic approach where it's like, okay, I got to do 10 reps. It's not like going to the gym and really working the eyes out. It's really about how, how can I gracefully relax my visual system, including my brain and my mind and my eyes. Um, and and that, that's a different kind of intention as opposed to I need to exercise my eyes and do these reps of these exercises. That's not really the way that I, I explain it or teach it. I really try and get people to think about it more as a relaxation approach. Let's see, Heather also said, are eye charts part of vision building? And if so, uh, one of the major or minor parts. Yes, the eye charts are the pretty much major part of vision building. Um, you know, we use the charts as the starting point to learn these vision building techniques like we did today. But ultimately, we want to take them off of the charts. Some people uh, talk about in yoga, they talk about taking your practice off the mat. So yoga is not just about rolling your yoga mat out in a bamboo wooden room with a bunch of other people and stretching for an hour. The yoga practice is when you leave the yoga class and how, how do you live your life? You know, it's more than just the physical side of it. So it's the same thing with the Bates method is we don't want to just get really good at reading an eye chart. We want to get really good at reading license plates and road signs and street signs and recognizing people's faces in the distance and reading ingredients on, on you know, things at the grocery store. And, you know, the, the charts are the training ground. And then the world is really the playground. That's where you get to really apply this stuff that you're learning in home with your charts. And then you take it out into the real world. So technically, vision building can go beyond the charts. But I really want you to kind of use the charts as the primary platform to be experimenting with this stuff on. And Dr. Bates said that if you can learn to see the eye chart clearly, you can see anything clearly. So it's sort of the gateway to clearer vision. Gwen asked if one eye is stronger than the other, should you cover the stronger eye? Yes. So typically, you know, I had a, when I started this process, I had a dominant eye and a weaker eye. And so as a way to balance my eyes, I spent more time with my eye patch on my dominant eye, which means that I gave my weaker eye more opportunities to improve. Um, but I also spent time giving the weaker eye a break by putting the patch over the weaker one, too. So it's not just about cracking the whip and forcing the weaker one to really pick up its pace. It's also about giving that weaker eye plenty of rest and relaxation because the reason it's weaker is not because it needs to increase its muscle strength or work harder. It's actually more strained than your dominant eye or your clearer eye is. So it needs more relaxation more more release and, and softness than you know feeling like you need to really work it harder so that it all comes back to that intention so great question oh yeah brian said he's bummed about the in-person retreat as well he was planning on it so yeah you know originally i was going to push it back to the fall um but at this point just with the uncertainty i'm just kind of figuring we're just going to shoot for next May 2021, just once once all this stuff kind of gets a little more settled down um, and people are more comfortable traveling and, and gathering. So, yeah, stay tuned. Hey, Hassan from Iran, thank you for being here today. Appreciate you coming. Uh, let's see, a mommy of two said, good morning. Which of all these exercises can still be effected, effectual while wearing eye contacts? You definitely still can, you know, get some benefit from them, even if you have contacts in, but that's not necessarily the ideal way to do this. Um, you get the most benefit by doing all of these practices with the naked eye. So no glasses, no contacts, just the naked eye. 
even if your vision's really blurry, we're learning how to transform that blur into clarity. And that's just not possible when our vision is being artificially corrected by contacts. So like some people shared today, like, hey, I had a, a clear flash. I had a moment of clear vision. If you have contacts in, you won't notice that happening. Even if you are getting the benefits and the improvements, the contacts and the glasses kind of fix your vision into this kind of static place. So I really do encourage you to do all of your vision practices with no contacts in. And it is okay to wear contacts or glasses for other parts of your day. But when you're doing your Bates method practice, I really think you're going to get a lot more out of it with no contacts. Yes, yeah, Sun Glare said Dr. Bates put out an article in 1928 saying palming should be done every hour. Yeah, that's a really easy way to kind of remember. Like, you know, some people even have digital watches that, that beep every hour. You can maybe set, you know, a smartwatch to do a little timer or something. Say, hey, take a little one minute palming break. You know, it's one o'clock, palm for one minute. You know, like sometimes we need those little reminders because sometimes the day can just go by and we forget to do this stuff. And that's why I've been really enjoying creating this Better Eyesight podcast over the past year because we've had the chance to go back and read through all of Dr. Bates's monthly publications, the Better Eyesight magazines. That is just a wealth of knowledge and information and suggestions and tips on all this vision stuff. So if you haven't checked out the Better Eyesight podcast, definitely look that up. Yeah, Cake, we can definitely listen to music and do the relaxation exercises at the same time. I think that music is a wonderful accompaniment to vision training. So you can put on a song and do some swinging to the, the beat of the song. You can you know listen to music while you're palming, and you can be visualizing the musicians or just let your mind come up with a visualization. Um, you can listen to music while you're doing your charts. Totally. And uh, it's probably even better if you sing along with it, too. Maybe you won't even dance with it, too. Michelle said, I'm working with your convergence divergence practices. Do you think stereogram images can help, too? I'm referring to those printed images hidden under a texture. Yeah, absolutely. So those are those were made popular by those magic eye, you know, those 3D magic eye books where you converge or you diverge to make this hidden image pop out. Those are actually really helpful tools in improving your vision. So you can either get a 3D magic eye book online or you can look up some stereograms online. Um, and that's a really I use those a lot in my vision improvement process. So once again, we might play with one of those in uh, next week's or, or the following week because that does that can really help with double vision too. Beata says hi from Gabby. Hello to both of you. I'm excited uh, to check in with you next week. And that said, Nathan, could you give us a quick explanation of how the sliding scale works for your virtual vision workshop in May? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, originally the, the tuition for the virtual vision retreat in May for the 16th and the 17th, the Saturday and Sunday, um, was going to be $5.55. But I, you know, I'm taking into account that right now, you know, things are kind of unstable in the economy and, and maybe some people are at work or financial things aren't, you know, too sure. And so I wanted to open it up to a sliding scale option. It's anywhere between 333 and 555. So if you actually go to that site and check out the, um, you know, the registration page and where to sign up and everything, there's a little drop down menu where you can choose 333, 444 or 555. Um, and those are the three main options, but it is sort of a sliding scale. So if you do, you know, want to do a different number in between there, you can reach out and let me know and I can set that up for you. But those are just the, the three presets that, that are in there. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted it to um, be a little bit more accessible and, and open to people, you know, taking into account that, that we might need to be a little more <laughs> flexible on that. So. And, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll be, you know, announcing this more in, in the next vision tune ups and, and over email and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll make sure I'll get all that information to you. Hey, John from Norway. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, Annette also asked about the half patch. Did you buy that, buy it that way? Or did you cut it yourself? I just made it myself. So I just got a standard eye chart or standard eye patch and you just fold it in half. 
And I just took some scissors and I cut down right down the middle and then cut out this side. So this one is for my right eye. And then I have an, another one that I cut the other side out. So it's for the left eye. And I mean, technically you could use this one for both and flip it over, but just you can see that the, um, the string is meant to be on the upper half, not the lower half. So, I mean, you could make it work, but you know, if you wanna, you can make one for each eye um, or you can kind of make your own version of it. And like the most rudimentary version of this is just your hand. You just hold your hand up like this and you've got the half patch because if I shut this eye, I can't see the screen, but I still have all that periphery there. So, you know, the, the, the patch is just nice because you can be hands-free with it. Oh, yeah, Tina said, just realized today and looking at your eye chart behind you that one eye has double vision. Looking forward to you covering this next week. So it, it's good to clarify between um, double vision and astigmatism because they're, they're kind of similar but different because double vision is when the two eyes are – sort of misaligned or they're not working together. So maybe they're not landing on the same point, which creates a double image. But the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because you said I'm noticing it in one eye has double vision. And usually that, that tends to refer more to astigmatism, which can kind of create the illusion of this multiplication of the letter. So you see the real letter and then you see this like ghost letter over to the side or above it or below it. So it, it definitely looks like a double image or a triple image or a quadruple image with astigmatism, but it might not necessarily be actual diplopia, which is double vision. Um, but we can definitely check in with that. Um, and yeah, based off of people's feedback today, I think I know what to cover next week with uh, some of this fusion stuff and, and working with double vision and astigmatism. All right. So, uh, a mommy of two said, you mentioned stronger eye. I wear plus three contact in one eye and plus 2.5 in the other, which is the stronger. Um, so the, the stronger eye is probably the one with the weaker prescription. So the plus 2.5 one is probably the stronger eye. And then the weaker eye is the one that needs the stronger prescription because it's not seeing as well. So it needs more help. So the plus three eye you could sort of consider that as the weaker eye, and then the plus 2.5 one is the stronger eye, um, but they're only a half diopter apart, so they're not that different, um, but you still want to work with each one individually. Yeah, Sarah, she says, uh, it is, norm is it normal for your weaker eye to switch after patching? My weak eye used to be the left, and now it's the right. Same thing happened to me. Uh, my weaker eye, turned into my stronger eye because of what I talked about of patching it more and giving it more time to develop. So the weaker one actually surpassed the stronger one. And now, you know, the dominant eye kind of switched. So that is possible when you do this. Christina said, is it good to put cooling iPads, compresses on our eyes and relax? Absolutely. Um, cold compress and hot compress are both really great. And Dr. Bates actually talked about hot cold therapy where you alternate the hot one and the cold one back and forth. So you get vasodilation and vasoconstriction and you get a lot of nice blood flow up into the eyes. So yeah, definitely uh, do a nice relaxing hot cold therapy session with a cold washcloth and a hot washcloth, or you know, you might have some other kind of tool that you got that you put in the freezer or the microwave or something. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really good thing to do. Sunglare said, did Dr. Bates ever talk about optic nerve damage or was that before his time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he talked about the fact that um, even optic nerves that have had damage, um, there's, there can still be potential. Technically, if there's even like light perception, even if your vision is like nearly blind, but you're still able to perceive light, there's still potential to, to get some improvements. So, you know, a lot of times nerve damage is considered to be permanent and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but I, I generally like to kind of push back on that a little bit and, you know, not ignore that fact, but, but really see, okay, taking that into account, let's see what we can work with to, to, to develop what we do have left um, if there has been any kind of nerve damage.
Shiraz said, why do some letters on the chart seem bold and others normal? So this could be a couple different things. It could be that astigmatism thing because sometimes astigmatism shows up in the eye at a particular angle. So if you have a vertical astigmatism or a horizontal astigmatism, that'll make some of the vertical lines or the horizontal lines seem to be darker than the vertical ones. Um, some astigmatisms are diagonal, and so diagonal lines might look weird to you. Um, so it might be astigmatism. It, it, it could be just basic blur that's kind of creating that illusion. Um, but Dr. Bates also introduced this really interesting topic called optimums and pessimums, which means that there are certain letters in the alphabet that you see better than other letters. And so the ones that are bold and they're black and they're easier to see might be your optimums. And then the ones that are gray or blurrier or more stubborn might be your pessimums. So it's actually really good for you to understand which letters are the ones that are already easier for me, which are the ones that I need to work on seeing better. Um, so it's just all good feedback for you to learn about how interesting and unique and fluid your vision really is. Oh, thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate it. And thank you, Chalda, as well. Glad you're enjoying them. And Michelle's saying, hey, from Italy. Thank you so much for attending. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So I think last question here, is it better to go cold turkey and not wear glasses at all when doing this? My current vision is minus 2.25 in each eye. That's a great question because when a lot of people read Bates, that's kind of the message they take from this, right? Is like, you got to quit cold turkey and you're not allowed to wear the glasses ever again. And this could work. You know, there are people who, who take that approach. But in general, I typically encourage people to take the weaning off route versus the cold turkey route. So instead of going from minus 2.25 to no glasses, maybe you could go to minus two and then to minus one and then to no glasses. And when I'm saying go to minus two and minus one, you're not really using them very much. You're just using the glasses when you absolutely need them. But for a lot of the other parts of your day, you are kind of cold turkey with it. You are just going without them. You know, that, that was my approach is when I was improving my own vision, I spent as much time as possible with naked eye, even though I was, you know, minus three, minus two. But whenever I needed them, I put them on. So if I had to drive or I had to work or I had to socialize or see something in the distance, I always used the glasses to help me with that until I could do it without them. But most other times in the day, I had no correction. So it, it's sort of a combination of this kind of cold turkey approach of going without the glasses and, and learning how to work with the blur. Um, but it is also helpful a lot of times to use the training glasses, the weaker prescription ones, when you need that extra clarity um, to make sure that you are staying relaxed and you're not straining. Because if you have minus 2.25 right now and you need to see something way off in the distance, there's a chance you're probably going to squint or strain and that's going to take you in the wrong direction. So if you can just put those weaker glasses on, you can stay nice and relaxed. And then when you're done that distant activity, you just take them off and then you're, you can still be making that progress. <laughs> ASMR, are you vegan yet? So I asked my eye doctor about Bates method and she said, we just don't know if it works. Isn't it their job to know? <laughs> Why don't they know? <laughs> that's a that's a great question, and and I think we're going to leave it at that for today. Um, it, it's a wonderful question. I don't have the answer for that, um, but I'm going to let you kind of contemplate on that. I I felt like I spent a lot of time kind of contemplating those types of questions when I learned about this stuff. It's like. Why, why didn't, why didn't anybody tell me about this? Why did my eye doctor tell me about this? How come nobody's telling me how much nobody's talking about these simple, natural things we can do. Um, and so there's a lot of potential reasons there, but, um, but that, that would make this drag on a little bit longer. And we've already gone a little over today, but definitely, you know, I've been enjoying doing these vision tune-ups and, you know, going through and interacting with you afterwards. Um, you know, I've been trying to keep the practice parts of the vision tune-ups kind of shorter um, and then, you know, taking time to go through some Q&A at the end. Uh, but there's a chance I might um, kind of extract the practice part.
parts out of the videos and kind of put them together into some sort of, uh, you know, video or course or something like that. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But in the meantime, definitely uh, I plan on being back here again next Tuesday, same time, 2 o'clock. Uh, it seems like we, we kind of as a group have come up with a, a kind of focus or topic to go into next time. And we can continue this discussion about natural vision improvement, how we can incorporate the Bates method into our lives and really improve not only our vision, but our life in general. So thank you so much for being here with me today. I hope you enjoyed learning about the eye charts and let me know if you have any other questions about it or need any more clarification on any of this stuff. I'll be happy to help. So stay safe, be well, and I will see you again next week.